Everybody, super excited to be here. We're IT people, so we love talking cybersecurity, but we're making sure today we bring it down so it's not technical and we talk to business owners and business managers that can be here today. Real quick, just wanted to do some introductions before we kind of dive into the topic, which is cybersecurity Q&A. A lot of times cybersecurity can seem a little complicated. So today we're gonna to try and provide some clarity with cybersecurity, answer some questions we get often, you know, some Sadara get often, and all of us, of course. So that way we can kind of answer those questions and open it up for general Q&A for anybody that's on the call. So real quick, I wanted to introduce the managed service providers that are here today. We this, The webinars we do are joint venture because we want to make sure that we train our clients and the community on different topics around IT, either from productivity, Microsoft 365 Suite, cybersecurity, or other really important topics. Uh, so together, we can usually get more people to show up to the webinar. We usually get really great speakers to speak at these webinars. So to start off, we'll start with Global Data Systems. Um, got Steve and Joe here from Boston. Thanks for joining y'all and for inviting people to the webinar. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, Global Quest is here as well with Mike. He's actually the one that kind of uh, recommended this one because uh, he works very closely with Sidara and really has a lot of faith in their team. Did you want to say anything, Mike? No, I appreciate I appreciate these guys spending their time to do this and Liz coordinating with your team. This is one of those things I think every client needs to be a part of and have a cybersecurity practice or a partner in their environment, helping them close their gaps. 100%. Because when it, if it happens, it's too late and it gets very expensive after the fact. Yep. And then Shane, of course, is here from Data Magic, the legend. We have two Shanes. Yep. Here twice, double, Here's double twice. your pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you guys putting this on. It's uh, good yeah. seeing you all again. So uh, awesome. looking forward to, to seeing what you guys have here. Mike, appreciate it. And then Alltech Services, I'm representing Alltech, uh, the other MSP that kind of puts these on. So just super excited. Thank you all so much for being here. We're gonna make sure it's exciting, interesting and impactful. Uh, we also have a solid uh, offer at the end. So last but certainly not least, we've got the, uh, the, the men that are going to be kind of doing this presentation today. We've got Derek, who is the CEO of Sidara. Somehow we got the head guy. So good job, Mike. You pulled some strings. And we got Dilip, who is the VP of cybersecurity. So like literally the guy. So when we talk cybersecurity, right, the guy that is, can answer any of the questions is here. So I'm just super excited to have these two here. You all want to kind of say anything before we start things off and I kick everyone out, not the viewers, just the, the presenters. No, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm um, looking forward to today. Let's make it interactive. This is a, a presentation, but I think none of us want to sit through a PowerPoint forever and stuff like that. So let's just make it interactive. Uh, we can stop with questions going on. I'd uh, love to get it going at it. So uh, awesome. happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thanks for having us. And thanks again, Mike, for setting this up. Really appreciate it. Let's jump right into some Q&A because that's why everyone is here. And obviously we'll have open discussions at any time. Anybody has a question, throw it in the comment section and we will kind of get it answered on the fly. But to start things off the first five, I don't even think I need to pull up the webinar or the presentation because it's literally just questions. So I'll just ask it and then if, you know, we'll go from there. So the first thing, this is probably the hottest topic when it comes to small businesses, medium-sized businesses, even enterprise because everyone's strapped on time and this, we're going to start off with Derek. How do you balance resources to tackle cyber amongst all the other daily responsibilities and duties of your job? Yeah, it's a good question, and probably uh, probably one of the one of the ones we get quite often nowadays. And you know, a lot of times it's organizations that are realizing that you know there's some new compliance regulation that now they have to deal with on top of everything else or they're having, uh, you know, their, their customers are sending questionnaires over and wanting to know what they're doing, uh, you know, kind of this whole vendor and supply chain lifecycle management that we're seeing more and more of nowadays, right? So it's flowing in from all different angles uh, and, and cyber insurance included as well. I know Dilp will talk, uh, talk, talk, your, talk all day long about uh, uh, just the cyber, cyber insurance side of th uh, things nowadays, but you know, it's, it's coming from all angles, right? So, you know, people are knowing that they need to be protected tactical side of things, but then there's all these other business sides of things that are, are, are really kind of flowing into that we're, we're seeing. So, I mean, the questions, it's, it's, it's a very relevant question. It's, you know, my team's, I'm already super busy. How do I take this on now? Or my team is already at max capacity. How am I supposed to do this and balance that? 
And, uh, you know, it comes into a couple different angles, but it's really a resourcing question, right? It's really about, um, you know, looking at roles and responsibilities. What are you doing internally versus what can you push to third parties? Um, what responsibilities are our teams taking on that maybe they really shouldn't be uh, to help balance these types of things? It's about separation of duties in some cases, right? If, if, uh, if you have to make a decision of, you know, keeping the lights on versus working on compliance or security, 10 times out of 10, you're going to keep the business uh, focus on the business side of things, right? So, so one of the things we, we always say is, is evaluating the roles and responsibilities and kind of looking at who are you using for third parties, who are you using for vendors, what types of services and, and SaaS products are you using? And how can you kind of start to push some of these security and compliance uh, requirements out to them rather than taking them internally? And it's not always IT. Uh, one of the things we see quite often when we get into these types of things is around physical security and people trying to do their own monitoring of their their, their uh, security cameras and door lock systems and pushing that to, you know, sometimes it gets pushed to IT or facilities when in, in a lot of cases, it's a very easy thing and super common thing to push to a third party vendor and let them be responsible for the risk side of things, right? Let them do the compliance questions, let them uh, really kind of take take hold of these types of things. Uh, and there's all different different angles, regardless of the, your size of your business, there's all different places you could look to, to kind of uh, make sure you're segmenting these types of things and kind of remove some of that responsibility off your plate. So it's um, that's probably one of the biggest things I would say is really kind of start to look at the individual pieces and really understand who truly is responsible and should they be responsible or should it be moved to, you know, a third party or again, even pushing out to Office 365 for, for email, right? Pushing, pushing all of that stuff off prem. You know, we're still seeing people running on prem email systems nowadays when, you know, the de facto standard is get get off of that stuff, get it to the cloud, make it their responsibility. They're the ones that are really in charge of security, um, at least from the infrastructure side of things. So that's um, yeah, at a high level, I'd say that's probably, you know, a, a, one of the, the big areas to start. You know, Delp, I don't know if you have anything. Yeah. To add. Yeah. I think just uh, you know, be realistic. Right. So be realistic with, with yourself, what your capabilities are. Be realistic what you have as a team. You know, your team, if you're an IT team, they're they're not doing 50% of the work. They're probably doing about 100 to 104% of what their capabilities are already, right? So adding security to them uh, without giving resources or time and stuff like that to them is just not realistic. And it's a, um, the, the bad actors always prey on some easy things, right? And a lot of time it's time that you're actually having a problem with. And it's not that your team is not capable from like that. They just don't have the time. So I would say be realistic with what you, if you're a, if you're a practitioner, uh, realistic with your team, if you run a team, as, truly assess what they have as cyber skills. You know, are they, do they just want to do it or are they, are they really good at what they're doing? You know, you know, if they're, if they're not, then you need to have third party vendors is like that. Even if they're competent, then you want to make sure that they have enough time to do that. So it's not an add on, you know, it's not a role that them long gone are the days where IT was the office manager, right? You know, the office manager was hash slash IT and slash do that. And, that days are gone in cyber. It's not even realistic to have that. So once you do that and you do have vendors, make sure you vet them, right? You know, vet them with their, talk to them, find out what their capabilities are. Um, cybersecurity is not just one button, right? There's so many different things in cyber like that. So each, each vendor has slightly different things that they're good at as well. And then when you do that, make sure you have vendor managers, make them accountable. Um, I won't talk about cyber insurance and all that kind of stuff yet. We'll get into that, but uh, to keep Thank one is That's definitely good. vendor management and keep uh just be realistic of what you got nice yeah i totally agree little anecdote for the next question like i'm officially now a business owner i split off as yeah. like helping the I'm an msp that i worked with but it's funny because i literally signed up for everything i was like <laughs> yes i need the sock yes i want ongoing meetings yes like like literally we're such a tiny company i just started like the, our it spend is so high because like i was selling it for eight years yeah. Like I understood the cyber risks that I was going at. I'd rather stay protected with somebody that knows their stuff than me trying to do these questionnaires and stuff. And the peace yeah. of mind, it's like, I haven't even called all tech once and I'm still like happy to pay. Cause I'm like, I just need a team that when I need that penetration test done, or when I need the yeah. MDR, or when someone's trying to attack me, I don't have to worry about it. Like, so I agree. Like, how do we balance resources? you guys nailed it. Like have a team that really knows what they're doing and obviously keep them accountable and know what's going on. I'm lucky because I work there. So I know what's going on right. for someone that's not, that hasn't been working there. They need to definitely get involved, make sure they're engaged in those meetings and, and, uh, and, and really make sure they understand what is kind of happening. 
at a high level as we're discussing today. Right. All right. Love it. Thanks. It's, it's uh, such a great it, it depends on the type of business a little bit too, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's. I'm, I'm guessing a lot of uh, uh, folks on here that are using one of the, uh, you know, one of the MSPs that are help, helping to sponsor this today. And one of the things we always encourage is, you know, make sure you're you're talking about these things. And when you do uh, to to your to your MSP, right? On on in, in terms of what are they covering? Because a lot of times, what we do find uh, when you start to comp compartmentalize some of the the risk or some of the services and break this up and really start to look at the different areas of risk uh, relative to, to security or, or your overall all, all business, you're not tying it to the business properly, right? It's still still stuck in an IT function, uh, and you're, you're not really addressing or, or documenting or, or covering these controls. So we see it all the time that uh, you know things are people going through these compliance uh, assessments or questionnaires and thinking that uh, they don't have coverage when in reality, their MSP has already got it covered. So, you know, when you start to break that up into smaller components and talk through these from a business risk standpoint, you know, get those get those folks involved because chances are pretty good. They're going to e either be able to tell you, yeah, you're already 100 percent covered or, you know, maybe there are a couple things you can do above and beyond or, or to, to really get true coverage. Yeah, awesome. Love it. Number two, this one's gonna, we're gonna start off with Dilip on this. Um, yeah. How can companies navigate risk management? So first of all, just cause I'm dumb, can we give a little bit of background into what risk management is and then go into how can companies navigate? The risk yeah, management? great, great, great question. So I love the fact that we're talking about risk as opposed to threats and bad actors and you know, like that. So there's a very different, right? So some people confuse both of them. Like they think, you know, a threat or a bad actor or you know, a bad actor trying to steal my data or take down my business and stuff like that. You know, that's very different than risk. You know, it's what's what's essentially what's about to come and how do you manage those things go like that. And uh, what we say in a lot of times is management, it doesn't mean just only you. It means push it off to third parties, push it off to other business units within your like that. So managing those things and actually having maturity against that is kind of the top level of what risk is and risk management is. You can't do risk management without having a framework, you know, actually having a risk framework. Um, if you're in the US, NIST is pretty much uh, the, the standard and de facto. Most governance now or compliances are picking some kind of NIST framework. CSF 2.0 is the one that just came out actually, I think a couple of days ago. It's official. So it's actually got a lot of risk management built into it. So that's the, kind of the first part of it. You know, have to pick a framework of what you're doing. So. When you have a risk, which we all do, you know, and it's your whole business doesn't have risk, it may be certain entities in your biz, business end. So you have to identify what your risk is, right? If you're in manufacturing, you know, obviously downtime, obviously cycle counts, all these kind of things are getting stuff out the door is one of the things. If you're in data and it's uh, intellectual property, it's not, it's the loss of your intellectual property. So identifying the risk is creating a new risk management. A couple ways to do that, obviously, is to create and identify a framework. Uh, the good thing now is a lot of the frameworks are built out of the type of business you have. If you have a manufacturing business, if you have a software business, if you have a third party or professional service businesses, a lot of the frameworks actually identify those things, the type of business you have. So way to do that is to assess and gap against that. So use your framework, gap what you have, what you don't have, understand what the governance and the risk and compliance is that you have. And then after you do those things, after you, you have your risk, you've got your risk calculator, you kind of got your gaps against that. You want to kind of create a plan of action and, and a milestones to do that. So plan of actions is where you start distributing some of that action, some of the work to get done internally, externally, third party, uh, consistently now uh, internal and external counsel. Or, you know, I, I hate to say it, but lawyers are a, a big part of the risk management process now. So uh, even when we're doing pen tests and stuff like that, we're actually doing it for the council for a company, you know, that's happening like that. So identifying your plan of action, pushing it towards the right people and the right properly equipped people, and then mature against that. You know, it's not about, it's not a checkbox. You're never going to win the race. You know, the race is consistently identify what your risk is and then mature against that. Um, Maturity is when you start to really understand, not just an age, you know, where your risk and, and how do you manage your risk is. So, um, I'll keep it at that just for, for right now. Uh, we can go on forever on that, but that's kind of how you navigate risk management. Nice. Yeah, yeah and I think, uh, you know, maybe, maybe just add, that, add, add to that a little bit as well. The, uh, um, 
the uh, from a framework perspective, you know, the, the good news is it almost doesn't matter what framework you're picking as long as it's one of the more established ones. Yeah. Um, they're, they're all uh, a different way to speak uh, the same language, essentially. And when you're getting these types of, you know, when you're getting questionnaires from your customers, when you're getting the questionnaire from your cyber uh, insurance renewal, uh, when you're getting, uh, when you're going through compliance requirements, right? Depending on what industry, or you know, if you're in healthcare, HIPAA has been around forever. Uh, you know, if you're financial services, you have the, you know, federal and state state regulations that are defined in, in in maybe two different levels in two different ways. But the reality is, most of them are saying the same thing. So when they have one control, it's 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 typically applying to um, all these different different uh, requirements uh, at a federal and a state level. So it's it's a great way to just to speak the same language. Um, and to know where your gaps really are, because it makes at the end of the day, uh, you know, it makes those sorts of, uh, you know, questionnaires and responses. It makes them consistent and it, and it makes sure that you, you know, when you give an answer, you know that it's it's truly an assessment of where the risk really is. Because, you know, if you're getting these questionnaires, these types of things from different angles, I mean, it's it's that that's what this is. Right. That's the risk management process from all these different organizations you're tied to that are, uh, you know, flowing that down to you. But the testing, you know, the testing is the, the other really big part, as, as Delt mentioned, you know, assessing and doing a gap against your test gap against your actual, uh, you know, framework or what you what you you know, the framework is, is helping you define where you should be. And then assessing where you really are in that process is, is important. You have to know exactly where you are. Or you don't really know what your priorities or next steps really should be. So there's the, you know, there's the control side of things. And then there's and Delt sort of touched on it, but, but pen testing and red team assessments, right? right. Actually ethical hacking. Right, hiring a team to come in to actually do this on a scheduled basis and a controlled, uh, more of a controlled manner, and actually see if you were a real-world threat actor. Can I get into your network? Can I take your data? Could I take you down? And if you know, we have, we have a pretty high uh, percentage of actually getting pretty far into a lot of these networks. But the whole point is to to know where these gaps are, and then to to, to be able to remediate them. Right, create that plan, that priority list of how do we actually fix these types of things. Uh, and those are not always technical discussions, right? Some of them go back to resource discussions of, all right, well, maybe you really do need to upgrade the server. Maybe that is that maybe upgrading this business application or moving this to the cloud really should be the priority rather than actually trying to fix something that is not really fixable. But you don't really know how to prioritize those things unless you're you know, assessing them against the framework or actually doing these types of technical testing as well. Yeah, I think if I, if I put it down to like five or six words, it's, you know, identify, detect, risk recover, test, audit, repeat, you know, and you kind of go through that process and that gets you maturity, you know, just don't just, you know, don't just check a box, you know, go through that process, make sure you can, you can identify what you have and detect and respond, make sure you can recover because things aren't going to happen. And then while you're not recovering, you're testing, you know, whether it's annually and then you're auditing sporadically, you know, going through that process and all those things kind of give you a risk management process and a maturity against that. Cool. Yeah, that, that was actually very informative. And, and I think one call to action, or not one call to action, but like one thing to think about here is when we talk about penetration testing, why is that so important? And why is that such a buzzword now in IT is the reality is like, it's really testing your systems. Yeah. It's really making sure, can somebody get in or not? And how can, if they can, how do we fix that? Because we can put all the layers in the world in place, but it's good to test the layers. It's like having a house put up there, but until it's testing, like, you know, what happens when a hurricane comes? Right. Um, Awesome. This is good stuff. This is really good information. I'm learning a lot today. We're going to start with Derek on this one. Moving on, why is it important to build a company-wide culture of security? Are we talking specifically, I think we're talking specifically cybersecurity. Yeah, it's, uh, um, I mean, you could say specifically cyber or, uh, you know, you could generalize it uh, with the risk discussion, right? Because as yeah. Dilt mentioned, you know, risk encompasses, you know, the, the, the business itself. And a lot of times, even when we're talking about these frameworks, it's focusing on risk and cyber is, you know, cyber might be 80% of it or, or depending on your type of business, you know, how, how you operate, there's a huge portion of it, right? Of data, if you're holding, you know, very sensitive data, healthcare data, you know, financial data, that sort of thing. Uh, or if you're kind of a, 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 you know, more operational manufacturing type of environment, you know, the uptime, the risk to production, those types of things uh, become a, a really, really big question there as well. Um, but it's, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's about building, you know, a culture of, of awareness, you know, tr uh, training is a big thing has always been a, a big thing and cyber specifically cyber awareness training is becoming, you know, frankly, just required in a lot of areas, yeah. you know, it's, in, in many cases, it's just not even acceptable not to do some, some form of cyber training. 
But at the end of the day, the goal of training is not to make people aware. It's to make them aware and enable them with some sort of confidence to do the right thing, to identify things that um, shouldn't be happening. I think the most common one, everyone, almost everyone's doing phishing training of some sort these days, right? You get an email, you report it, you don't click on it, don't open the attachment, right? I mean, those are the basic things we don't want users to do. But it, but it goes into different areas, right? It goes into, well, hey, I found this flash drive in the parking lot and I plugged it in just to see what was on it and something ran on my computer and I don't know what happened now. And that's an, we've seen that actually happen, right? And now all of a sudden you have you know software, uh, I'll, I'll generally say a virus of some sort running in your environment because you know someone intentionally dropped a flash drive uh, in a parking lot, something to that effect. Um, it gets into, you know, physical door lock discussions, right? Are you, uh, you know, how do you handle your badges? How do you allow people in and out of your building? How do you, mm -hmm. how do you uh, where do you put cameras? Where do you just make sure, how do you make sure you know what's important to your organization, how you are identifying risk? And you want to encourage people to feel like they're part of that process. And, you know, so, so that's like the operational side of it. But then the other kind of really big reason to make this as a culture, kind of a, a cultural shift uh, is that it makes having these discussions at a leadership level or at a top level a lot easier, you know, and it's it's not always budget. It's about, you know, you, so sometimes you get pushed back about wanting to put multi-factor authentication in place, right? Because it's a burden on people's, you know, day to day. But if people are really accepting why that's important at a, at a leadership level, uh, it's a lot easier to help adopt these types of things. And it's a lot easier to have discussions about budget or spend when you really understand why it's important and where it fits in. You know, cyber is one of those things where um, it's still pretty new to the industry, right? I mean, people have been dealing with, I mean, look at HIPAA, right? It's, that's been around, the, that's the, just the technical, the digital, the cyber aspect of HIPAA has been around for more than 20 years now, right? And uh, financial uh, industry, auditing financials and those types of things, that's been a well-established practice for a very, very long time. Cyber is changing like every single day, right? Frameworks are still changing, requirements are still changing, and certain insurance is still changing. And, you know, uh, you know, basically you, you're starting to see you're having to adopt these technologies to help cover some of these gaps that maybe you weren't uh, you never had before or you were never spending money in these areas before. And now all of a sudden this is a cost that is never going to go away uh, because now you have to have coverage in this. Multi-factor is a perfect example. Right. You know, nobody had multi-factor 10, 15 years ago uh, in, in small business or middle enterprise. And now it's almost a de facto standard of requiring coverage. And that's a cost that just is never going to go away. You just have to be able to accept it. So I think building and having these discussions about culture across the organization really helps to have these types of conversations uh, about, you know, what is, what is realistic and what what can you really cover and, and what is really appropriate and what has to be done to really kind of manage risk for the business. Yeah, I think um, even my mother does MFA now. Uh, so there's a, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's definitely a shift in uh, in culture and stuff like that. If you don't understand your culture, you'll never have a great cyber program. You can have the technology, you can have the people, you can have the process. So, you know, the PPT, as everybody calls them, people process technology, right? That is very different in every different culture, right? So does, uh, does do you do an org chart of security, right? You know, does your president have domain admin access, right? Or, does, you, know, you know, in our all our cyber minds, absolutely not. It shouldn't follow the business in that way. So... But those are things you have to deal with, you know, when you're in when you're a director of IT and like that. So identifying your culture, having compensating controls against that and having buy in. I mean, how many people have done a MFA launch and didn't tell the business really that, you know, and then some salesperson or some director says, I will never have that on my machine and ever again. And now that ruins your entire MFA uh, launch. You know, we even at um, at the county levels, the very high levels of, of things, culture still even if they're required to do it, it's such a big thing. So I think sprinkle in understanding your culture, making sure you get buy-in before you do something is another thing. And, and and start small, do it in chunks, and that'll help you with your technology and, the, and all the things that you're trying to implement at the same time. Yeah, love it. Yeah, I think that's so important. It's It can be so quick, like you can quickly get the whole the whole team on board with cybersecurity or, or, or pretty much anything if you, if you make it part of the culture. And I know that's this can sound fluffy at times, but it's just true. Like the cybersecurity yeah. awareness training, like we really push that here. Like it's okay. Like, hey, let's, let's see who gets the highest score. Like let's incentivize, right. like we need to be aware of cybersecurity and the videos are very helpful. And just again, anecdotally, like I think about, I'm a new business. I'm starting out. Like it's all I think about is risk. 
Like yeah. I have laptops for everybody because if the internet goes down here, I need them to be able to go work from home. But I'm like, oh wait, but that's a risk too. Like what happens to the thing? Cool, I got the IT company to set up Intune. I can remotely wipe this thing. It's right. encrypted. I can just shut it off right away. You know, it's like, cool. I don't have to worry about that. When people are coming into the office, literally they use their fingerprint. That's how they get in. And it auto locks after a minute. Cause I like force functions within my security, right? Like I don't want to someone have to remember to click the thing. I want it to do it automatically. Like, cause again, the risk is we can't leave like force functions and security are, are, are so important. It's like MFA. It's like, oh, they're going to remember to change their password or whatever. It's like, no, let's just force it. You got to click the button. It takes a second. It's a, it's a simple force function that significantly reduces risk. And like that just needs to be part of the culture. I love y'all's points there. Yeah. Awesome. So this one's for Dilla. What are some steps and considerations for organizations looking to start their journey into cybersecurity? Yeah. Long question. Um, Sometimes you uh, you don't get to choose your journey, right? Sometimes your journey is that you've been infected, you've had a problem, uh, you know, uh, some you you walk into the office and and your servers are down or ransomed or you got a note or something like that. So hopefully that doesn't happen, you know. But sometimes you have to do that and you have to kind of be ready to know who to call or who know what to do. You know, do you have great backups and stuff like that? So. If you're not in that situation, hopefully, and knock on something uh, for Micah on this particular case, pick, understand your governance, your risk, and compliance. I can honestly say, if you don't understand what you're mandated to do, you're gonna you're gonna spend a lot of money in the wrong spots, and then you, re you recognize that you're missing some of the really main components. So, start your journey to know what you're absolutely mandated to do. Uh, if you're in a particular state, if you're a particular supply chain, if you sell to the government, if you if you're in a HIPAA environment, are you in a bank environment where uh, you're identifying those those to do? So it's, it's a term called governance, risk, and compliance (GRC). Know what you're mandated to do first. Once you do that, you got to identify what the components that you have. A couple of different ways to do that is a pen test. You can also do a gap assessment as well and understand what your actual journey needs to be and what are the basics, basics of like that. Once you identify kind of the things that you need to do, you want to make sure that you share responsibility. Cannot go back into your IT room, your data center, and start creating this massive plan without understanding that there's going to be more than just you. We always say cybersecurity is not IT. They're very, very different. They're a part of IT, but it really has much to do about the business and the risk. You may not even know all the things that you're, you're responsible for because you were never even told. So create a plan. Make sure that it's been part of the shared responsibility and definitely don't do it all yourself. You know, definitely don't own everything. I guess it's cyber insurance. I'll, I'll say it once right now. You know, I can guarantee you most IT people have not actually seen the cyber insurance the questionnaires and stuff like that. Or maybe it was answered by a previous IT person or something like that. You don't even know where your journey is already, what you've already signed yourself up to. So identify what you need to assign yourself up to gap it, start with that, share the responsibility and, and don't do it yourself. That was probably the the quick points they would say how to how to build a journey and start a journey. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, and I uh may, maybe just to add to that a little bit too. The uh <clears throat> probably some of the, the biggest areas that we see gaps in uh you know when you kind of look at the big picture is really the monitoring, the response and the testing phases. When you just in general, when you look at all these kind of these these control sets, when we say controls, like in Tuck NIST, it's you know almost two hundred line items of all these different things that touch all these different areas of the business. Uh, and you need to, I mean, that's user onboarding, offboarding, HR functions, physical security, right? It goes all over all over the board. But when, but there are a significant number of things you have to be doing, or you should be doing, even if it's not a compliance mandate. That's uh, you know even if you're not you know you don't have a regulation that says you have to do NIST compliance. You, know, you still use it as a as 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 a as a baseline as a guide, right? You can you can choose if 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 a, if a control is overly burdensome to the to the way you do business, or it's overly costly uh, in what would require you to operate. As long as you're evaluating risk, you can choose not to do these types of things, right? It doesn't mean you have to do all of them. But you know, one of the biggest areas uh, that we see that covers a significant portion, we say somewhere between thirty five to forty five percent of the control sets is really kind of the monitoring of your environment, right? Knowing what your users are doing, what data they're accessing, 
what countries they're logging in from, right? I mean, there's this big shift uh, of, uh, I kind of mentioned it, you know, everyone, everyone's getting off of on-prem email systems. Everybody should be right. either is going to or should be in the cloud for email, but that opens up a whole nother set of requirements where the accessibility of those services are, are, are so much easier uh, and you don't maybe necessarily have, right? It's not behind a firewall. You don't have controls, firewall controls in front of those services now. And now you're relying on the controls within Office 365 or, or G Suite or what, what have you to, to, to help apply some of these uh, restrictions. Now you need to monitor and evaluate these things, right? What countries are users logging in from? Are you, know, are you looking at that sort of stuff on a daily basis? You know, do you have uh, someone logged into the same mailbox from, from two different geographies at the same time that you don't know about? You know, how many uh, mail routing rules have been adding into a mailbox, right? It's one of the most common things we see once uh, in an email compromise is, you know, some bad actor gets into a, a, a mailbox of a, an assistant or a finance manager, right? And you put a rule in there that is going to automatically delete inbound emails from a certain person so they can inject themselves into this conversation and, and, and try and, uh, you know, redirect funds or payments or those types of things. So uh, it's a very easy thing to do to set a trigger to uh, say, hey, tell me anytime someone puts a new mailbox rule in. You know, I guarantee you everyone in your organization is not adding mailbox rules every day. It's not gonna, it's not gonna ruin your day to get a notification about those types of things. But it's the monitoring about all this behavior that are indications, early stage indications of a breach, kind of the lack of monitoring for these types of things. Um, and then the response side, what do you do when, okay, well, there's a mailbox rule created, that person's on vacation right now. I know they're not looking at their mailbox, all right disable the user reset the password now you start your incident response process right the uh the the, the risk assessment the gap assessment the framework side of thing is gonna gonna tell you to have an incident response pr pr uh, process and program when this sort of thing happens you know exactly what to do call your msp disable this user talk to your uh you know your it director or or, or what have you um, and, uh, but, and then you have to test it, right? You have to test these types of things, test your incident response, and then you have to test it, right? You have to test these types of things, test your incident response plan. Uh, one of the things, one of the things we're doing all the time now is tabletop exercises, right? It's just going through, and this could be a basic, you can do them internally. You can make it simple. Don't overcomplicate these. This could be a 15 minute exercise of, Hey, if this user gets compromised, what exactly do we do? Do I know where our plan is? Do I know who to call? Do I know what buttons to click? Um, and it could be a fifth, as simple as a 15 minute test, right? You don't have to test everything under the sun, every possible thing, uh, right? But it's this testing your process of knowing what you should be monitoring, how do you respond to things? And then how do you test them to make sure that you know that when this does actually happen, because it will happen at a level, that you have uh, the tools to uh, in, in place, uh, tools and processes in place to respond appropriately. Yeah, I think if you're still thinking uh, perimeter security, you know, if you're still thinking firewalls, endpoints, and, and data, you know, permissions, you know, Act, uh, Active Directory or GPOs like that, the shift of where your data is, where your risk is and kind of mentality. So we used to say in the triad, put everything in the middle and, and protect it and give it a hug and, and secure it in multiple layers. Um, identifying your journey is, that is just one of the areas that you are. You are a SaaS company, whether you like it or not, you are, your data is all over the place. Is your data in other people's? Is there supply chain coming into your environment as well like that? So. Your journey is really to identify where your stuff is, start with that, and then come up with a plan to kind of do that. And there's, like Derek said, there are some easy, easy wins that you can do. You don't have to start with all the uh, bells and whistles and stuff like that. You can change mindsets, go for the things that are very easy and, and, and digestible, you know, and start with that. And, and doing an assessment of those things is really to kind of like, what's the ease of use? What's the difficulty of those kinds of things? Not just the identification of as well. So. Um, start thinking in that way and start thinking maturity as opposed to, you know, yes or no's kind of thing like that. So switch away from perimeter security. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. This is great. Yeah, again, I, I hate to just keep talking about me. It's just that a lot of our listeners are like business people. So, and like, I'm literally going through this right now, rather than being the person selling it, I'm now the person buying it and like trying to figure out what I need, what I don't need, et cetera. And I'm again, I go for all the things <laughs> like literally all the things for such a small company. Our spend on IT is, is very high as well as marketing because I just understand the value of like I see what happens to small businesses where they didn't get the right layers in place or they didn't get the gap analysis or they don't have an IT company. They have that person that they reach out to every now and then and then they get hit and they're out 100, 200K. And it's like, yeah, no, I'm going to skip all of that 
But yeah. I skip all of that and not worry about that. And like an example of understanding, like we don't even really have a firewall here because it's like whether I'm working here or the office or whatever, I don't need to worry. Like we're no longer a bubble, like you said. Right. I need yeah. to hear on the endpoint. And yeah. like that's just my my reality of it. And I have it where nobody can log in outside of Florida. Like if yeah. you're an employee of mine, you cannot log out in outside of Florida. That's not because I don't want people leaving Florida. It's because bad actors are not in Florida usually. <laughs> bad actors are in China and Russia and all these places. And it just says, hey, you can be literally can't get in. You can have all the credentials, you got the MFA, whatever. There's a fort, there's conditional access saying you ain't getting in. Right. And if people go on vacation, I can make an exception. Oh, you're going to Georgia or whatever? Yeah, I'll, I'll open you up that week. So anyway, this is a really great discussion. I really appreciate y'all's input on this. Yeah. All right, last question here. And again, anybody that's on the call, and we appreciate y'all being here and, and sticking with us, feel free to throw a question in the comments. This will be recorded. It will be on uh, all the uh, IT providers' YouTube channels. I'm sure Sadara are going to probably put it on their YouTube channel. So you can definitely go back, see the parts you like, skip the boring stuff. Yeah, yeah, there's no boring stuff here. <laughs> so last question that we have here, and this one we're going to start off with Derek, is um, what are some best practices for developing a budget for cybersecurity initiatives. Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. And you know, we kind of hit on this a little bit, you know, going through some of these different questions is that, you know, this is really not an IT question. This is a business uh, risk question. You know, so, you know, one of the things we we often talk about, right, is your level of spend needs to be rel uh, very closely related to your level of risk, right? Uh, that uh, in particular areas. Right. What do you do that makes you money on a day to day basis? And how do you know what the risk is if that's interrupted? And if it's interrupted, how do you quantify it? Right. If you're down for one day, what's the cost to, uh, to the business to doing that? If you're down for five days or more, if you have a, a, a reportable breach or if you're in an industry where you if you have a data leak, you know, like like healthcare, or financial or or government, uh, where you have to be reporting these types of things and you have to know be able to prove what was leaked and what wasn't leaked, right? And you have potential fines associated with that. You know how much data you have relative to if all of that was stolen and reportable, what's the fine potentially occurred for incurred for, for those types of things? So um, you know, none of that is, is an IT uh, evaluation, right? But knowing those types of things is really going to help you kind of balance what proper spend should be on these types of things. You know, the other thing I, I mentioned, you know, before is kind of going back to culture and having these business wide discussions. It, it, you know, again, cyber is very uh, early stage. You know, a lot there's a lot of uh, spend on things that didn't exist, even didn't exist at all five to ten years ago. Let alone, you know, weren't weren't readily adopted. And some of these costs just aren't going away, right? So tie them to cost of new employees when you're doing things like MFA, right? Do you have a cost that uh, if I hire a new person, here's what the loaded cost of that person is? In, include security in that, right? It's not I'm putting security on top of all these things. That security's rolled into this discussion. You know, their laptop is going to cost me X. Their Microsoft uh, Office 365 license is going to cost me, you know, cost me whatever. If you're at E3 or E5 or whatever, you know, your CRM software, your, you know, uh, uh, ERP software license for that user. Roll the MFA, the endpoint, the EDR, all of those things right into that discussion so that it's it's a cost. It's, it's a discussion about cost of doing business on the, on the long term, not necessarily just uh, adding cost on the top these top uh, on, on top of these types of things. One of the things we hear kind of quite often is, you know, the complaint about new regulations being forced down and, and there's no funding for these types of things coming through, even though now you have to deal with these. You know, I think the reality is there are grants available, um, even for the private sector, for some of these types of things. You know, critical infrastructure, certain manufacturing types. You know, if you're in the defense sector, uh, CMMC is a huge thing for the last really, really kind of uh, becoming extremely important right now. But it's they've been working on this for you know 15 plus years. You know, they're allowing you to put some of those costs into your product and flow that down to the customers, right? How do you evaluate those types of things? So, you know, again, it's uh, it's looking at this from the business uh, side of things, not necessarily just, you know, well, how much should I spend on security and how much shouldn't I? Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's um, just acknowledge that it costs money, for one. You know, you'd be surprised how many people uh, in IT take on security without even understanding that the costs and stuff like that. So if you haven't sold that to the business internally, or if you're, you're a closer to a business owner, just acknowledge that it costs money. Um, it's not this magic thing in the corner that, you know, that's that nobody knows about. It's really a part of the business. Kind of like what Derek said, it's, it's a line item in your spend against every employee at this point. 
it, it's going up. You know, it's definitely going up. You know, the last couple of years, it was, I'd say, about 7 to 8% of IT spend internally. And that's moved about to 11 or 12% now in the last year or so, where you should be spending approximately, depending on your risk, depending on your, uh, your areas, about, you know, 12% of your budget. IT budget on security. A lot easier to put that in the budget before than after. If anybody's been through a breach, about 80K to get somebody to come in on a, on a breach and response time after the fact. In, and you will be fighting with your cyber insurance about that all the way through the process. If you had, especially have, if you haven't done any of the things that you said you were doing. So the cost is, is going to be there. Uh, I love how Derek said, tie that to every new cost of new, new employees. Acknowledge that it's, it's the part of the business. I think now finally it specifically has, has been acknowledged as a an integral part of every business right you cannot do business without a erp system a laptop a da- access to data email server like that those are just acknowledged now cyber starting to get into those things as well i think the other thing for me is don't make purchases without buy-in from the business you know if you're doing something small like that that's fine but if you're going to be putting in a huge system you need to get the business involved in the buy-in and kind of to Derek's point, you got to make sure that they understand the risk. Make a business case is, is something I can, I see people, IT staff like that, try to do it. And then after the fact, and now they're trying to move their budgets around. It's like that. And they may get one year in and now they've lost that uh, going forward, you know, and you know, the, well, nothing's happened. What am I getting for this money that I'm now spending kind of mentality, right? You didn't make the business case for it before. Get your CFO in from a risk standpoint. They're all about risk. Uh, I've, I've spent many uh, CFOs talking about the amount of things they do. Everything is a number to them, right? So risk of the business, cycle counts, process, acknowledgement, production, you know, all these things are tied to cybersecurity now. Make sure that you get your CFO involved. Uh, if you can get your CFO involved, you're going you're gonna to have much better developing a budget for that. Get to the table, as I say, before, uh, before uh, you know, you're just kind of given a budget and then do what you can with it. Uh, get production involved. You know, if you're plant managers, you know, software developer, you're a software developer company, you know, you know get, your, get those people involved as well. Uh, don't tell them, don't be no, the, the office of no, do a, a no, but here's the solution for it, right? So that's how you talk to your, your production your, and understand where you make money. Uh, the other one would be kind of like, what, what's the downtime cost, right? I think Derek kind of, kind of talked to that, you know, what's, what's the downtime cost? Uh, put a number against that. Your CFO will know exactly what that is, you know, and you can say what your part of the risk is. And, and finally, for me, it's just kind of don't be a hero. I've long been the day where I don't need to be the smartest person in the room every day and stuff like that. You don't need to do it all by yourself. You know, like I said, many people help you when it comes from a budget standpoint. It's probably even not your strongest points. Most most IT or, or direct like that, uh, budget's something they think about after and give like that. So if you're hired to keep on that from an IT perspective and continue on with cybersecurity, make sure your budget, you're in, in that budget point. These are all excellent points. Now that I'm on the other end yep. of things, it's even more frustrating that people would be mad at my quotes. <laughs> <laughs> like, again, like I'm not an M- I'm not an IT person anymore, right? I yeah, support yeah. MSPs as a, the marketing, but like I'm now a business owner. I have a business that's not an IT business. And like I asked for the absolute highest internet option available for this location because speed of internet keeps us more productive. Right. I'm spending five, six, seven thousand dollars a month on employees right and yet and i get them the absolute fastest computer i absolutely can where they are not slowed down a little bit right but i see i used to see people there that's they're a hundred twenty thousand dollar employee on a computer that takes 15 20 minutes to start up in the morning and it's like that is burning your budget and it's the same thing that would happen with cybersecurity, where it's like we need to understand that if you're down one day one day it is a significant amount of revenue that would pay for for the highest level of security for a month. Yep. And you know, I had I said I didn't put a ticket, but I remember I do that. I did have a ticket the other day, and it was like this weird outlook issue. Again, I was in IT for eight years. I couldn't figure it out. I was googling, whatever. I was like, this employee's gonna be out for the day. No, it wasn't outlawed. It was like a it was a it was a truly hindering her ability to work. And I'm like, if I didn't have this company, yeah. Like, could respond quickly and get her going like that is literally like six hundred dollars or something gone. yeah 
So, yeah, so it, don't be a hero, right? So it's, you know, yeah. push that risk to the to the people who know how to do these things, you know, yeah. put it in the contract and response times, SLA is all like that. So, you know, you're reducing your risk on that. You actually have somebody to, to rely on you know, like that. So, you know, um, your, you know, 14 hours in a data room, fix something is, is, is not just the 14 hours that you took away from the business. It is the hundreds of people or whatever you're, you're partnering with, or, or actually your business itself. So having more people in the room that, that the clear mandates of what they do and what they don't do so valuable. We don't, uh, you know, I, you don't want your your high end director of IT and like that changing toners, right? Nobody ever, nobody. It's it's kind of a crazy scenario, you know. It's a hundred dollars an hour for a toner, right? So yeah. same thing with cyber, right? Same kind of things like that. Don't spend 100%. spend that money on on the things that you shouldn't be doing. Go do the things that you need to do to make the business better. Hundred percent. Yeah. Right, you know, on the, on the flip side, of that too. You know, I touched on, and I, I don't know if anyone, you know, on 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 the call here is you know, experiencing getting questionnaires from their customers, right? It's becoming more and more common in just in just about every industry nowadays of, you know, getting the questionnaire of, you know, how do you protect our data? How do you protect yourselves to make sure you can, we can still, you know, you can still service us or send us products and those types of things. And, you know, frankly, if you're putting new customer acquisition at risk or spending time having to defend these types of questions when you don't have, when you can't just go, yep, we got, we got all those covered. Here's, here's our report. Here's how we do it. Right. If you're spending uh, uh, time dealing with those or, or <clears throat> frankly, putting those potentially new customers at, or existing customers at risk, you know, it's costing you even more then, right? It's going the wrong direction. It looks like we have some questions. Do you want us to kind of walk through these or uh, how would you? Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We got a question here from David. Great question, David. And then I'll, I'm going to start letting the other guys in in case they want to help answering these questions as well. This has been sure. extremely informative. Super happy we did this. Super happy we're going to have recordings. I think there's a lot of dense, good topics yeah. that can be kind of reviewed. So I'm going to start letting people in. We've got a question here. Cool. Let both well, um, yeah, I don't know if everybody can see the question from about VPNs. Should you use them? Should you not? You know, so it's changed, right? So we talked a little bit about perim perimeter security, where the only time you ever wanted anybody in your environment, you wanted them through a VPN, right? I think the first thing we do is assess where your data is. You know, my recommendations about VPNs can be multiple things. Uh, my security mind says VPN on all the time, right? No matter what you're doing, the laptop can't get on going without going through a proper VPN. You know, that's the security thought of it. That uh, that's the best scenario. You know, with MFA, you know, anything that's outside of your environment that's hosted or SaaS like that. So you may not get the option to have just VPN with your third party app, your SAP or something like that, and it's all hosted. It's outside of your network. So yes, they're still needed. I would say don't rely only on that for security. It really is, that is just a more primitive security mindset, unless you're gonna turn VPN on for everything, every person does. So I think that's first, I'll leave it at that because I know there's lots of people here. Um, if anybody else has got any other opinions on this question. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add, you know, another part of the question was, are they are they important and they do what they're supposed to do? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'd say there's there's kind of two different types of VPNs you're seeing. Now, maybe sort of a third one I'll throw in there, but one is the traditional like network VPN to your uh, connection to your your corporate network, right? You log in, you authenticate, now you can get at your internal file servers and those types of things. And absolutely they do what they're supposed to do, right? Encrypted tunnel, it is secure. It's, you know, it's been, proven, you know, time and time again, those, those work the way they're supposed to work. Uh, right. Once you get that connection, you get it's it's as if you're on the internal network. Totally. You know, some of the other ones are right is is, a, is uh, you know, Internet VPNs, you know, helping uh, about general privacy and those types of things. And, you know, those are OK, but they're all also only, and technically, yes, they're they're providing some sort of anonymity, but they're also only as good as, you know, from a business perspective, there's not a lot of use cases in a lot for, for those in, in a lot of cases. They're also only as good as the company that's providing them. Right. You don't know. How well they're actually protecting and monitoring and, and keeping anonymity to those types of things. And the third one is really kind of this 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 uh, I'll just call it uh, kind of remote access uh, for individual applications, right? It's coming a bunch of different forms and fashions. Publishing applications out through your firewall in a VPN-like connect connection, right? If it's a single application, the only thing I tech, those, those will work as well. But what I would usually caution on is uh, really just thinking about it. Is that the right place for the data to begin with, right? Is that something that should just really be in the cloud rather than, you know, keeping that risk on prem and then you manage it, manage it that way. Right? You're not, you're not combining risk. Because oftentimes what happens is uh, there's additional complexity to putting those types of systems in. And then sometimes down the road, it gets, 
I'll say forgotten about and when an adjustment needs to be made or all of a sudden we need two more applications. Now you're you're kind of expanding your risk without really realizing how, how far it's actually going. So, you yeah, know, just always good conversations to have about, you know, uh, you know, upgrading those types of technologies, getting access to the data. And again, back to monitoring with all of these things, you yeah. know, do you, are you able to report on a user if they log in to VPN at one in the morning, right? Do you get a notification that says, hey, this person only works nine to five, you know, they shouldn't be VPNing in. That's not malicious by itself, but we need to check on that, right? We need to validate that. And if that's not the right person, if there's compromised credentials there, kill the session, shut off the, you know, shut off that user's account, and now you're in incident response mode. So um, just like any sort of technology, you know, VPN included, you need to be have a, a plan to be able to monitor the proper behavior around those types of things. And again, what we want to catch is that these types of things at the at stage one and two. You know, what we say is ransomware is step ten. You know, we want to we want to catch these types of activities at step one. <clears throat> free for these actors uh, where they're doing initial access, right? They're doing initial recon. They're doing things that aren't a problem yet, but you want to know when improper behavior is being used in the environments and, and VPN's a you know, perfect example of, you know, um, it, it's going to do what it's supposed to do, but you still have to be able to, uh, to monitor it. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, just clean up of your VPNs. I think that is, uh, you know, something that, you know, people offboard did you offboard your vpn access and those kinds of things so you know what we see in vpns in general is it's kind of set it and forget it kind of mentality so we don't want to make sure when we're doing those kind of things make sure it's a part of your offboarding of employees third parties a lot of times when we do through a firewall audit and you see vpns in there and it's you know somebody left two years ago right so and somebody's forgotten about those things and stuff like that so if you're going to do vpns make sure you keep it in your uh onboarding and offboarding process if you, I would consider uh, a WAF on top of that, if you're just a central location with just your, your data inside like that. So a WAF, WAF, you know, kind of would be something that uh, I would consider just in addition to the, just the VPN. Nice. The other thing that you did mention as well, that <clears throat> when you give someone access to VPN, it is an extension of your network. So right. you really need to know that those machines that they're connecting from are protected. Absolutely. Because that could be a backdoor breach into the system. So uh, yep. it, don't just let employees use their yeah. home computer to VPN into the network. They need to have a, a work Excellent. computer Excellent. or one that's protected. Excellent point. Um, I, that better be domain joined. Um, I wouldn't want a, a VPN access for uh, uh, mom's iPad, you know, those kinds of things and stuff like that. So try to, you know, I would definitely limit those and then have some kind of advanced endpoint on those devices. You know, if you've got a traveling sales team or you've got, remote workers and stuff like that. So VPN plus an advanced endpoint that's updated, you know, not just from your home office or, or HQ, things that are, that would be the two things I would say on, on top of the VPN, uh, but excellent point, Shane, of not have non uh, assets from the company uh, with VPN access. I think, on we got, I think we got time for one more question as we wrap up here. This one, not necessarily cybersecurity, but I figured since we have a lot of IT people here, it might be a good one to take a stab at. Yeah. Teresa is asking, our billing software has been pushing to make us purchase the cloud for their storage. They are partnering with another company for this service. Our billing is currently working properly without being in the cloud. Our ID suggested that we hold off until we have issues as the cost to transfer into the cloud is very high. What would your thoughts be on this? Lots of answers for that one. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give a couple of small ones. Great question. Yeah. Is it a... Uh, is this third party, is the billing software for cloud different than one on-prem? We do see a lot of on-prem companies, uh, software for billing or ERPs and things like that, no longer supporting on-prem kind of technologies and updates and patches. You know, are they going SaaS and SaaS only after that? If it's a smaller company with a homegrown thing, then I would have more worry about just doing that. Are they trying to make it a cost center to charge for cloud and those kinds of things. Preferably, I think things that are enterprise wide would be cloud at some point and, and they're known. If they're not known, then that's a great vendor assessment, ask for their security assessment, uh, kind of things that they need. Make sure that your data is being complied with uh, and then push the risk to, their, to them as well. If it's working internally and all internally, make sure your control's internal for that. But I, I think cloud is here inevitably. If you're in a large SAP shop and those other kind of shops, you're ultimately going to be pushed there, whether you like it or not. So having a plan for cloud, uh, as we call it, cloud as infrastructure as a service, where they're putting up their servers up into the cloud, or if they're a cloud-first kind of uh, technology. So identifying those two roads 
and that would be kind of where you'd want to go and kind of kind of get that maturity started. So I'll leave it at that. I know there's lots of people here on that may have some other uh, adds to that. Yeah, and maybe, the other is, uh, maybe just add to what, what Dill had, had mentioned is, you know, the maturity of that company becomes really important too. You now some of these smaller third parties are just taking what their on-prem was and then hosting that version in AWS and calling that cloud, right? So, uh, you know, if, if making sure that you understand, can they, can they keep that protected properly? You know, what sort of risk is being pushed off to them? Is, is there a transfer of risk that's going to happen, right? Are you now responsible today for incident response? If someone gets into that system, sends out bills and appropriately redirects funds, is that your responsibility now? Or does that change when it go to the cloud? I mean, those are the types of things I, I would definitely be thinking about. The other side of that, and not to make this more complex, but as you go through kind of the overall risk evaluations and your gap assessments and these types of things, uh, when you're thinking about these things, if you have gaps in monitoring and response today, a lot of times that's a, a, a good question to ask yourself when you're talking about transition. Is is it, if we do this transition, would it also make it easier to do the things we're not doing today? Is it, is it make it easier to close those gaps if we were to do that? So, you know, sometimes that that's a that's a tough question to answer when you're trying to make a business discussion, a decision about, you know, is it is it is it going to how is it going to change our business if we go move this to a completely separate separate platform? But there's there's definitely uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot of pieces to it. Yeah. yeah. And I think the reality is, Teresa, I think that's a really, really wonderful question. A lot of moving parts. Whoever invited you um, to the webinar, they'd be more than happy to jump on a call with you, you know, do a review with you just to provide some free, awesome advice. For the other listeners today, one thing Dillip said is making sure to audit the vendor, to make sure the vendor is secure. This is so important and, and, and so valuable. Anybody that is on this call today and you would like a vendor audit questionnaire, what should I be asking them? Uh, you can reach out to you can reach out to whoever invited you. They will provide a vendor audit questionnaire for you. It is very straightforward. They the vendor either has this or they do not, and that will let you know whether this vendor whether you should work for them or not. In addition, if if you're a current client of any of the uh, MSPs here today, of course, we're constantly reviewing your cybersecurity and providing recommendations. If you're not a client and you'd like a free cybersecurity assessment, please reach out to anybody who has invited you to this. We'd be happy to do that for you, help you uh, go over some of the gaps you might have in your organization and potentially get Derek and Dillip to help us out in that as well. So really, really appreciate it. Derek, Dillip, this has been exceptionally helpful, very inf informative uh, for anyone here. We will... Uh, make sure to have the recording up on YouTube. Anything else before we kind of conclude today, y'all? No, just thank you. That's it. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah. Sidera, guys, thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. Great, great webinar.